I, I put a word in the title, and Rabbi Salinger told me most people don't understand what the word is. Uh, it was lishma. Um, but let's just set a little background. Uh, one element of the tradition is mitzvos, commandments. These are rules of what one is supposed to do. Now, a human action is not just a motion of a body. Sometimes your body moves and it's not an action at all. It could be a twitch. Or you could stumble on something and fall. And falling isn't an action, it's just an accident that happens to you. And even the actions that you do perform, there are many different motivations. What it is you're trying to achieve, what it is you value. And we classify the moral status of an action in part on the basis of the motivation. Sometimes people do things solely for their own benefit. Thank you very much. Sometimes people do, people do things only for their own benefit. We classify that as selfish. And even if what happens benefits somebody else, we downgrade the moral uh, status of the action because the motivation was either completely selfish or was criminal. I'll give you an example. Um, it's well known that a good person with good motivation can do a bad action, and a bad person with bad motivation can do a good action. I'll give you examples of each. George is drowning in the river. Peter jumps in at risk to himself and pulls George out of the river, saving his life. And Peter rolls George over and fishes his wallet out of his back pocket and runs. All Peter wants is the money. That's all he wants. It's very difficult to fish the wallet out of a uh, pocket of someone who's drowning. So he saves his life in order to steal his money. If he could have gotten the money and let him die, he'd have done that. It just, just wasn't convenient, that's all. So what he did, he saved someone's life. That's good. But he had vicious motivation and he's a criminal person. On the other hand, doctors 200 years ago with all good intentions, when people had a fever, would bleed them because they believed that that was good medical practice, so it was in the medical books. They were harming them. They were actually harming their health. That's bad. <clears throat> so a good person with good motivation can do something bad. A bad person with bad motivation can do something good. And then when you look at the action as a whole, the motivation plays a big role in, in deciding how to judge the action as a whole. When Peter saves George's life in order to steal his, steal his money, although we say it was good he stole his life, we don't give Peter much credit for it because his motivation was bad. And although the doctor deserves credit for caring, and fidelity to the standards that were available at the time, we definitely don't judge the val action as a valuable action because, in fact, hurt, it hurt their patients. So now, the question arises in serving God, what role does motivation pay, play? How important is motivation in serving God? And there are several different aspects of, to this question, which I want to, to disentangle, and then we'll talk about what's called the Shema, which is the ideal motivation for serving God. First of all, we have to be careful with our vocabulary to distinguish between motivation and intention. Intention is what I am aiming at, 
what I'm trying to accomplish. But why I'm trying to accomplish it, to accomplish it is a separate issue. It's a separate issue altogether. Um, for example, um, let's suppose I'm trying to <coughs> convince someone to eat microbiotic food. Now, let's suppose you believe that microbiotic food is really a, a, a healthier diet. I'm not sure that's true, but suppose you believe that. Still, you might ask, why is he trying to convince him of that? Is it because he wants his health to be better? Or is it because he owns the only local microbiotic food outlet? And he's looking for another customer. So the mere fact that what he's trying to get him to do may be good for him, that doesn't yet explain the quality of the action from the point of view of the agent, how much credit he should get for it, and how we should look at his moral character. Now, let's take a person who does an action which there is a mitzvah rule to do. The first question that you have to ask is, was he intending to do a mitzvah at all? Was it his intention to do a mitzvah? You say, well, how could it not be? I'll show you. I'll show you how a person could put on tefillin and not have an intention to do the mitzvah. Someone is selling tefillin. And he is tied the knots. And he's selling to, to a person who can't tie the knots. He doesn't know how to tie the knots. So listen, these are top quality fillings. Here's a certification. Here's the price. I think you're not going to do better than this. And he checks around. And he thinks, this is really a good, a good bargain. But tell me something. Will they fit me? So the guy says, well, try it on. And we'll see. So he's put it on his head, and it's a perfect fit. Oh, terrific. Thank you very much. Yes, I'll buy them. Did he put on Phil and Shalosh? Absolutely not, because he didn't intend by putting it on to do the mitzvah. He was intending to try it on to see if it fits. That's not the same as doing the mitzvah. Intent to do the mitzvah means you have to believe in God. That means an atheist can't do any mitzvahs. He cannot do any mitzvahs. So says the Ramban in his introduction to his commentary in the book of Job, among other people, in other places. So that's what he's intending to do. But then the question will be, why is he intending to do a mitzvah? That still hasn't been answered. He might be intending to do the mitzvah because of reward and avoiding punishment. He might be intending to do the mitzvah because of, of reputation. He might be intending to do the mitzvah because he thinks, I have actually met people like this, that if I do mitzvahs, then God will cure my illnesses. We had a person at summer camp many years ago who was a, a, a brittle diabetic. Brittle diabetic means their blood sugars go up and down, at that time anyway, for no reason whatsoever that they could figure out, totally unpredictable and therefore extremely difficult to treat. And this person said, I'm planning to keep kosher and to keep Shabbos because I'm sure that if I do that for God, he'll cure my diabetes. That was the motivation, to get a cure for the illness. There are many reasons why a person might intend to do a mitzvah. So those reasons are the motivations. So you have to distinguish what you intend to accomplish versus why you're intending the accomplishment? You know, why send a check? Well, we have with, withholding tax today, but once upon a time, you used to send a check to the IRS. You send a check to the IRS in order to pay your taxes. But why are you paying your taxes? Well, it could be because you feel you owe the money for the services you get from the, from the government. Or it could be because you don't want to go to jail. Or because, we, because you think that they're tracking you from the federal government and they're going to destroy your life, you know, if you don't, if you don't pay your taxes. There are all sorts of motivations for doing something. Now, 
The ideal motivation for serving God is called Lishma. Lishma is translated, described, paraphrased in a variety of ways, many of which are very misleading. Maimonides, in the 10th chapter of Laws of Repentance, says the following words, To do a mitzvah l'shua means me'ahavas ha'adon asher tziva kein, from the love of the master who commanded it. The motivation for doing the mitzvah is the love of the master who commanded it. I think you can hear that if someone defines lishma as for its own sake, that doesn't really capture it. For its own sake. What in the heaven's name would that mean? <clears throat> Put on film because I like putting on film? Just for the sake of putting on film? In fact, a background piece of information, although the Rambam apparently didn't have this background available because it's written in the Zohar, but... The mitzvos are called tayag itin, which in, in Jerusalem Aramaic means tayag etzot, which are strategies. There are 613 strategies. A strategy is a, is, a, is a procedure whereby you accomplish something else. If someone says, why are you doing that? Say, because part of my strategy. You say, yeah, what, what is your strategy leading you to? Says, to doing it doing the strategy. The strategy is for doing the strategy. That's what it's for. He says, sorry, sorry, we're not on the same planet. That's not what strategy means. A strategy is a procedure for getting something else. That's what it is. Okay, here it's to express your love for the master who commanded it. That's the Shema. That is the highest possible motivation for serving God. But this raises two questions. Number one, is it really possible? Is it really possible to do something without any self-concern, without any self-consequence uh, uh, self, um, for yourself that's what is motivating you? Some people will say everything you do is at least partially selfish. Some people will say that everything you do is always completely selfish. Is it possible to avoid selfishness? That's one question. And number two... I've said so far that's the ideal motivation. Are there lesser motivations that are kosher? Lesser motivations whereby if you do it for that reason, you'll still get credit? I'm going to start with the second question because I think it's very important. The answer is yes. This is ideal, but it's not necessary. There are other motivations which definitely make the mitzvah a kosher mitzvah, for which you will get credit. Probably not the same amount of credit, but you will definitely get credit. First of all, there's a system of, pun of, of reward and punishment. That system is true. God created it that way. It's one of the fundamental principles of, of Judaism, that people are rewarded and punished according to their actions. In a number of places, the Torah writes explicitly, I want this person punished, and I want this person punished in public so that people will see and will be afraid and will do the mitzvahs properly. That means the Torah is putting punishment in place in part as a motivation for acting correctly. If the Torah created punishments in part to motivate people to act correctly, it must be that a person who is motivated the way the Torah set it up gets credit for what he does. There's no question. There's no question about that. So a person who says, I put on filling because I want reward in the world to come. And I don't eat cheeseburgers because I don't want to be punished, neither in this world nor the world to come, gets credit for eat, putting on filling and gets credit for refraining from, from, from uh, cheeseburgers. They're both kosher performances of the mitzvah. But one is encouraged, urged, to graduate beyond a self-serving motivation to the point where you can do it with Shema, which means for love of the, of the Master who commanded it. And by the way, for those who have had a casual brush with the Nefesh Chaim without studying it in depth, 
This definition the Rambam gives is agreed upon by everybody, including the Nefesh and it includes Talmud Torah also. The study of Torah is just another mitzvah, and the definition of the Shema of the study of Torah is doing it out of love of the Master who commanded it. And if you have been acquainted with the idea that the Nefesh says that the Shema means doing it in order to understand it full stop, nothing beyond just understanding it, you're making a tragic mistake. The Nefesh Chaim there is talking about what your psychological focus should be while you're doing it, comma, not what your ultimate goal is in doing it that motivates you to do it in the first place. Yes, your psychological focus ought to be on understanding what you're reading, according to the Nefesh Chaim, perhaps solely on that, but most of the time anyway. That's like asking a surgeon, what are you doing in the middle of brain surgery? Well, I'm removing the tumor. That's what I'm doing. That's not why he's doing it. He's doing it because he wants the person to live rather than die. But at the moment, what he's concentrating on is removing the tumor. That's what he's got to do. So when the Lefesh Chaim says that the study Torah of the Shema means to pay attention and try to understand it, that's what you're doing. But it doesn't tell you why you're doing it. To do it with the Shema means to do it out of love of the, of the master who commanded. Now, yeah. The Rambam uses the word Lishma there, and he says that's the definition of Lishma. Uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit why. Right? When you ask the question, what you're, forget- what you're forgetting, and you're not alone, is that this is a commandment. It's a commandment. It's just an activity. And it's an activity which happens by accident to agree with one of the rules written in the Bible books of Moses. It's a commandment. If you don't experience it as a commandment, if you don't experience what you're doing as a response to the commandment, if you don't have in mind that you want to satisfy the commandment, you're not yelled say anything. It's worthless, absolutely worthless. Like the professors of Talmud who study, teach in universities and they eat treif and they marry uh, shikses and so forth and so on, right? They get no credit whatsoever for studying Torah 10 hours a day because it intended to be a commandment. Now, the Shema means for the sake of the doing this commandment. Not this activity, but the commandment. Well, then the commander has to be part of the picture. And it's a question of what relationship you have to the commander. The highest relationship to the commander is to serve him out of love. That's agreed upon by, I would say, almost all sources, even though some say a type of year is higher, but that year is built on love, like the Gemara and Sota says about, Moshe, about Abraham Avinu and, 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 uh, and Eov. So uh, I think when you ask the question, what you're forgetting is that it's a commandment. For the sake of the commandment, not for the sake of the activity. Um, so now, the question is, if you're not there, if you're not doing it out of love of the commander, of the, of the, uh, the master who commanded it, how do you get there? Here the Gemara says something very famous. And when I first read it, says in the Gemara. So, of course, it's correct. But I had two, I think, quite substantial objections against it, and it took me a long time and considerable reading to come up with some understanding. The first was, oh, so the way you get there is this. It says, person should occupy himself with Torah, according to one girsa, or Torah and Mitzvah, so the Gersa, Shalom Lishma, not out of love of the Master commanded, not for that motivation. A person should occupy himself with Mitzvah, not for the ideal motivation, because from doing the Mitzvah with non-ideal motivation, you will come to do it with ideal motivation. That's what the Gemara says. So first of all, that confirms what we said before. If the, the, the Gemara says, you should always do it with non-ideal motivation, because from that will come ideal motivation, it can't be that doing it with non-ideal motivation means you don't get credit for the mitzvah. But um, the thing that bothered me was, number one, what about the professor of, of, uh, of uh, uh, Talbot at the university? 
who spent his whole life teaching Talmud and never comes to Lil Shemot. Just needs to be a straight counterexample. It doesn't happen. And number two, psychologically, if you do something for a certain return, you get a certain credit or a certain benefit or a certain reward, and you do it habitually for years, won't the dependency on the reward become stronger and stronger? Why should I imagine that if you do it long enough, you'll come to outgrow it? It'll naturally lose its appeal and naturally lose the necessity for that reward in order to keep the activity going. Okay, the answer to the first question I got was I saw in the writings of Dessler a quotation of Surah Salat. And even here, I had to go through stages before I before I grasped it uh, appropriately, if I have reached that stage. <laughs> he said, Rishos Salanta says, this rule that if you do it, shalom l'shma, you'll come to do it l'shma, is only for a person who wants to come to do it l'shma. Only for a person who wants to come to do it l'shma. Otherwise, the rule doesn't apply. Well, saying that immediately cuts out the, the professor. He doesn't want to come to the Shema. He's no concern of serving God altogether. So, that's why he doesn't count as a counterexample. But now, how does it work? So at this point, there's at least a, a plausible psychological process, even though it runs afoul of my second question. Um, here's how it works. We're talking about a person who wants to do the mitzvah of the Shema, out of love of the Master who commanded it, but he's not doing it. Of course, listen carefully, in addition to wanting to do it, Lishma, he also, let's say, is going to, to Shul in the morning, Dhamma Dominion, he also wants to sleep late. So, you know, he sets his alarm for 7 o'clock because Dominion starts at 7.30, and the alarm goes off at 7 o'clock, he says, oh, 7 o'clock, where's the snooze button? Bang, snooze, right? 7.10, snooze, finally gets out of bed at 8. Now, he wants but he doesn't get out of bed because he's lazy. So, here's what he says. I don't get out of bed because I'm lazy. Suppose I consciously add another motivation, which will help. So, he says to his good friend, let's get together 10 minutes before davening to learn before davening. 7.20. Fine. Next morning, he sets his clock for 10 to 7. Not 7, 10 to 7. He's at 10 extra minutes. And the ring, alarm rings at 10 to 7. Where's the snooze But Wait a minute. Ruben's going to be waiting for me. He's waiting for me in the base magic at 720. How can I face him if I'm not there? I asked him to set this thing up. So, with great frustration, gnashing my teeth, I drag myself out of bed, and I slug down the coffee, and I went down there at 720. Okay, quiz time. Why am I getting out of bed? If you answer to avoid the embarrassment of seeing Ruvain with, uh, 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 not having gotten there, that answer is wrong. That's not the right answer. The right answer is, I have two different motivations operating simultaneously. Remember, we started with someone who wants to do it, Lishma. That's also a motivation. Only, given the condition that he's in, that motivation isn't enough to win the battle. So he adds a second motivation. When he gets up finally on that faithful morning, it's the 10 to 7, it's the desire to do it with Shmo plus the desire not to be embarrassed in front of Ruvain. The two of them together are what get him out of bed. Not just the self-serving motivation to avoid the embarrassment. Now under those conditions, the Gemara is saying, there's a promise that you'll graduate ultimately to do it with So that certainly cuts out the professor. But it's more than that. It's not just two together. The second motivation to avoid the embarrassment in front of Ruvain was put in place by the first motivation. It was the desire to do it with that led me to invent the motivation of avoiding embarrassment to add to the motivation of doing it with which then generates the promise that I'll be able to graduate and do it with So that certainly cuts out the, the professor. But then, what about your normal psychological expectation? When you do something for a reward, then you, 
the more you offer you for the reward, the more you become dependent on the reward. I don't think you ever heard of anyone who worked 40 years for a job and then retired. And then, and then of course, once you retire, they stop paying you. Maybe you get a pension, but they don't pay you your full salary. And the next day, went back into work because he just got used to working and now he doesn't need the reward and now work for nothing. I don't think so. I think he's on the golf course. <laughs> if he's very unfortunate or if he's more, much more fortunate, he's in the base measures, he's learning, right? So why would I think that having done it so long for a reward, you'll come to do it without the reward? I think I figured that out also. I think so. Not everything is like that. Not everything is like work. Take, for example, um, the 11th commandment, or Sinaitic pronouncement, uh, to parents, your child shall play a musical instrument. That's for Jewish parents. Right? <laughs> Very ambitious as a violin. Now, you take your five-year-old with a quarter violin, they make small ones for kids, and, uh, and you say, son, I guess, or daughter, <laughs> this is your future. Violin, not only, but it's going to be there as part of it. Now, the kid's not interested, believe me. <laughs> he really is not interested. It's, it, it's painful, the muscles aren't there, and not only that, he starts with, with playing the violin. For the first year, he's making noise. Just scratchy, irritating noise. He knows it's noise. You know it's noise. He knows that you know that it's noise. He knows that you know that he knows that it's noise. It, it's, it's awful. It's just awful. Why does he do it? Because you, as a Jewish parent, provide incentives. Carrots and sticks. If you'll do this, you'll get an extra piece of cake at the Shabbos meal. Or we'll take a vacation together if you do it for three months. And if you don't, I'm going to lock you in your room. <laughs> I'm going to embarrass you in front of your friends. My child shall play the violin. Right? <coughs> okay. So for a year, two years, maybe three years, he does it because of the system of incentives that you provide. Let me tell you something. He'll outgrow it. When he starts making music, he'll outgrow it. I was a musician. I didn't play the violin, but I was a musician. It happened to me, and it happens to everyone. When you start making music, the beauty of the music and the thrill that you are making this beautiful music carries itself. You don't need the external motivation anymore. Many mitzvos are learned, especially when, when you learn them when you're young, Mechanically. These are the words to say. This is how you put on the straps of tefillin. This is how you stand the Shemona Esrei. They learn mechanically. These are the things that you do. Why are you doing them? What are you accomplishing by doing them? What experience is it supposed to provide? A seven-year-old? Eight-year-old? Nine-year-old? If he's in a fortunate community, he may observe adults going through something which for them is exciting and then something for them which is important, well, children live a great deal of their young lives imitating adults and wanting to imitate adults. That's, that's built into their, into their character, into their nature. But eventually, in prayer, when it comes to understand the words, when it comes to understand the stakes in terms of <coughs> personal development, what he can do for the world, for his family, when he comes to understand a little bit about what Kedusha is, he realizes that the tefillin are Kadosh. They have Kedusha, they have holiness. So the experience of the mitzvah changes, it deepens, and it starts to be able to carry itself. I think music is a good analogy because there's something inherent in the deepest part of human psychology, what we call the soul, that responds to music. I don't think anybody understands it, but for example, um, people have trouble controlling their muscles. They have spastic motions. If you play music, they can dance smoothly, smoothly, without any, any dis jerkiness in their motions. The music harnesses something in your, in your deepest psychology which overcomes muscle problems. Exercise, many people exercise to music. You have much more strength. I, I have a regular exercise program. We, we have, you have much more strength, much more endurance when you do it to music. Uh, dance. 
Well, you can dance yourself to, uh, for hours. The music carries you. So I would put it this way. The same creator who gave the Torah is the one who created the soul. He created them to fit one another, hand and glove. When they do fit hand and glove, the soul is motivated by the music of the commandment. And then you don't need the external incentives anymore. That's how you outgrow the Shalol Shema. But in the meantime, when you don't have that music, when it is mechanical, external, superficial, you may need that extra motivation to get you over the hub. Now, the, the, the quotation from the Gemara, which I mentioned before, there's a commentary in the writings of Rabbi Salante called the Koch Yitzchak. I didn't study Rabbi Salante carefully and not encyclopedically, and this is the only thing I know from that commentary. I'm not trying to sell something that's not true. But he, he says, what about the word la'olam? Always. A person should always occupy himself with Torah and mitzvahs for a non-ideal motivation, because from that he'll come to graduate the ideal motivation. Says the Kolech Yitzchak, that means you don't get there in one big jump. You don't jump over the Shalol Shema. If you skip the Shalol Shema, if you think you're already on the level of the Shema, doing it for the ideal motivation, you're fooling yourself. You don't know what the ideal motivation really is. The way the human psyche is built, Kodesh Baruch Hu says, this is the doorway into the garden. The Shalol Shema is the doorway into the garden. So he made us in such a way that we have to do it that way. It's another argument that, of course, you have to be Yotzei the Mitzvah. We wouldn't set it up in such a way that you have to do it in a bad way. So that's the explanation of how you can expect the Shalol Shema to lead to the Lishma. Now, there's the other question, the philosophical question, which I mentioned at the beginning. Isn't it true that, that what we do, we do for social, selfish reasons? There's even a position called egoism where everyone always does what he does only for selfish reasons. Three universals. Everyone, always, only. There's nothing but purely selfish motivation. If that were true, then this project would be hopeless. We're talking about doing the mitzvahs of the Torah out of love of the master who commanded them. There's no such thing. Psychologically, that's just a, 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 uh, an illusion. Because everything you do, only for selfish reasons. Okay. Now, suppose I ask a representative of this idea, we'll call him the cynic, uh, why do you think so? I don't naturally look at the world that way. Yes, I do have selfish motivations, but I also have other motivations that aren't selfish, so it seems to me. And uh, I classify my, some of my actions as selfish and some as generous. I classify other people's actions and characters as selfish and generous. You're telling me this is all a mirage. It's all a mirage, it's all a big mistake. Really, everything is always selfish. Why do you think so? So, <clears throat> one argument that cynics give is the following. He says, I'll give you a challenge. You describe to me your ideal action that's done out of generosity, out of altruism, for the sake of another, and I'll show you that's really selfish. Now, my challenge is this. If you give me your ideal altruistic action, I show it's really selfish, then Kabbalah Homer, all the other ones that aren't ideal, that are weaker than that, must also be so. So I say to the cynic, okay, I'm willing to take your challenge. Here's my example. It's January 23rd, Chicago. And I'm driving down the highway, and my car quits. It's sleeting. The temperature outside is minus 6 degrees Fahrenheit. Not Celsius, Fahrenheit. And <laughs> my car quit. I can freeze to death. I pull over. Now, I'm telling you a piece of ancient history. When a person had a problem like that and he had a, a, a radio aerial uh, you know, antenna outside the car, he would tie a white handkerchief to it as a sign of distress. Today, you'd be murdered and they'd, they'd take your car away. They'd try to tow a truck and steal it and bury your body and so forth and so on. But there was a time when people actually held other people. So I tie a, 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 my handkerchief to the thing. Five minutes later, a car pulls over behind me. Guy comes over and he says, what's wrong? I said, I don't know. 
I, I don't know anything about it. It just stopped. The guy said, well, you're in good luck. I happen to be an auto mechanic. Open up the hood. So I pulled the latch. He opens up the hood. He messes around in there for a couple of minutes. And he closes and says, start her up. I start it up. Bang. It's working. He climbs back in his car, drives off. The sleet has covered his license plate. I can't make note of his number. I will never see him again. I have no clue who he is. So I say to the cynic, I think that he did that in order to help me. I think that's an ideal case where his motivation really was for my sake. He's not getting anything out of it. Okay, the cynic says, that's your best case, right? I say, yes, watch. Tell me something. How do you think he felt when he drove off? Good, bad, neutral, distracted. How do you think he felt that? How do you think he felt? Don't you think he felt a certain satisfaction, maybe a certain pride that he helped you? <coughs> Feels good about himself? Feels good about, about his character? Don't you think so? And I think about it and I think, well, yeah, probably. Probably he did stand in the sleep to help me, you know. I guess he did feel good. Ah, says the cynic, now tell me this. Suppose he had passed you by. How do you think he would have felt then? I'm stranded. He's an auto mechanic, after all. He passes me by. He probably could have helped me. He may feel guilty. He may feel a certain amount of self-criticism, self-recrimination. Oh, says the cynic, so he got pleasure and avoided pain, did he? That's what happened when he stopped to help you? He got the pleasure and satisfaction of doing the right thing. He avoided the pain of self-criticism and failure and guilt if he did the wrong thing. And you call that altruistic? You call that generous? You call that doing it for your sake? You're just naive. You're just naive. He did it to get pleasure and avoid pain, as I just showed you. And since that's your best case, it follows that every other case is really selfish. All motivation is selfish. Closed case, says the sinner. This is very common, especially among sophomores on a college campus, after the third beer. Um, is he right? No, he's dead wrong. He's dead wrong. First of all, his argument is absolutely worthless. That doesn't make him wrong. It just means his argument's no good. I'll explain why he's wrong in a, minute, in a minute. The argument's worthless because he's confusing consequences of the action with motivation for the action. All he showed by his argument is that he got pleasure and he avoided pain. Those are consequences of what he did. That wasn't the question. The question wasn't what happens when he does it. The question was, what is he doing it for? An altruist is someone who acts for your benefit. A selfish person is a person who acts for his benefit. The fact that he gets pleasure and avoids pain doesn't mean that he was acting for the pleasure and for avoiding the pain. That doesn't follow. Those are just consequences. Let me give you an extreme example in case you're un, un, undeservedly skeptical. My friend Philip lives in Santa Monica, Florida. This happened 10 years ago, and it's also fictional. <laughs> 10 years ago, the Mississippi River overflowed its banks. Now, the Mississippi River is, I don't know, 1,000 miles long or something, so it starts overflowing its banks up, way up the river. And they tell you in five years it'll be in this city, and ten years it'll be in that city, and next day that's in there. It's going to overflow, and it's going to swamp the, the city, and could cause the danger of health, and, and certainly going to ruin a lot, of, uh, a lot of property. And people are putting up banks of sandbags so as to hold back the water. You see pictures of people hauling 100 pound bags of sand, you know, this is, this is 40 years ago. And then and building these sandbags to hold back the water. Now, Philip is living in Santa Monica, you know, enjoying the surf, and he's thinking, these people are really in danger. That's really a terrible tragedy, what's going on over there. I can't sit here in Santa Monica and just watch that happen. So he figures out, in two weeks, the river will reach this and this place. It'll take me 36 hours to get this and this place. If I get there, I can spend a good week helping them. So he gets in his car, 
and he drives for 36 hours, and he gets 30 pounds a week hauling 100 pound sandbags to build a sandbag wall to hold back the water. And he drives back to Santa Monica. Two months later, he's talking to a friend about this experience, and the friend says, ah, you spent a week hauling 100-pound sandbags. Do you think that you increased your muscular strength with all that exercise? So Philip says, you know, I haven't thought about it, but I guess you're right, you know. Uh, seven days of hauling 100-pound sandbags? I guess I did. And then the friend says, so that's why you did it. You did it for strength. You did it for exercise. You had nothing in mind about saving them and helping them. It was all selfish. You just did it to get stronger. Is he right? No. No, he's not right. That's stupid. That's stupid. Strengthening his muscles is an effect of what he did. There wasn't a reason why he did it. He didn't even think of it till later. So when you prove to me that everyone who acts gets a pleasure and avoids a pain... You have not yet proved to me that he's doing it for the pleasure and for avoiding the pain. You haven't proved that. So the cynic's argument is worthless. It's worthless. And at this point, we say, well, he hasn't got an organ for his position, so he might be right, but he might be wrong. And I naturally, not I, all of us naturally, think that some of the things we do are selfish and some of the things we do are selfless and, and, and generous and altruistic. And we classify other people that way, and the cynic has not given me a reason to change my classification. It's conceivable he's right, but he hasn't given me a reason to think that he's right. So at this point, the cynic certainly has no convincing case. This, I think, is pablum. This is philosophical pablum. An eight-year-old can understand this, and it's uncontroversial. But then there are arguments that can be made to settle the case in the opposite, in the opposite direction, the direction that there are altruistic actions. Now, my reading of Bishop Butler, the British philosopher, is that this is the argument that he gave. There is a book by two people whom I respect who say that this is not his argument, so maybe it's my argument. I don't know. <laughs> but this is what I took from his writings, and I'm going to call it Butler's argument because I, I believe that's what, that's, what, that's what he meant. And he uh, offers the following uh, thought. Let's try to think of a case of a person who is doing an action and the only pleasure available for him in doing the action is the pleasure of satisfying a desire. In other words, if you like, you can divide desires into two categories, or seven, or 24, and for different purposes. I'm not saying this is the whole story. But some pleasures you are more or less hard hardwired to feel. You, uh, you have a ch uh, uh, the experience of feeding your child ice cream for the first time. You'll see something very interesting. You put the, the spoon to his lips, it's cold. The consistency is quite unfamiliar. He will pull away. No. Oh, oh, this is ice cream, baby. This is going to be different. Your <laughs> life will never be the same. You know, I put it in his mouth. And part of him resists, and he may even spit, out, spit it out. But once he tastes it, he's sold for life. Right? Okay. He's hardwired to have a pleasure in eating ice cream, especially vanilla ice cream. <laughs> That's utterly unlike playing chess. Usually, maybe not always, but usually people play chess to win. The reason you're playing chess is because you want to win the game. If you win the game, you have the satisfaction of getting what you wanted. If you don't win the game, you won't have the satisfaction of what you wanted. Let's take an extreme case. You're playing, this is going to be the opposite, but it'll make the point that I want to make. You're playing, you're 22, and you're playing chess with your 16-year-old nephew because you want to interest him in the game. So you are planning to throw the game, to lose it, and give him the encouragement that he thought he beat you, the interest him to play more chess. So you make this sloppy move and that sloppy move, but he's too stupid to take advantage of the sloppy moves. And, and then it's obvious you have to take this piece and take that piece. Right? When you fake finished, you failed. Did you get any pleasure out of it? I don't think so. The whole point was to encourage him, and you failed in doing that. Okay? So here's, here's Bishop Butler's argument. Imagine a situation where the only pleasure available 
is the pleasure of satisfaction. You're doing what you're doing because of a certain desire to do it. If you get what you desire, you'll have the pleasure of satisfaction. If not, not. There are no other pleasures available. I'll say it again because when I pull the rug out from under your feet, you're going to wonder where it came from. It's coming right from here. This is a case where the only pleasure available is the pleasure of getting satisfaction of your desire that's motivating you to do it. Okay. In a case like that, I want to ask you, what is the desire aimed at? What is the desire going after? What is the goal of the desire? In particular, could the goal of the desire be a pleasure itself? Answer is no, it could not, because that's a contradiction. Where did that come from? How does he get to that? That doesn't follow. What is he talking about? Let's try it again. The only pleasure available is the pleasure of satisfying the desire. The desire is going for X. It wants X. It's pushing to X. It's, it's, it's motivating me to act to get X. The only pleasure available is getting X, feeding it to the desire. The desire is satisfied, and as a product, as a result, a consequence, I have the pleasure of satisfaction. Could X be a pleasure? Then there'll be two pleasures. X will be a pleasure, and... Satisfied desire will be another pleasure. X can't be a pleasure. Can't be any pleasure at all. What this proves is that there are desires for things that aren't pleasures. And then, if that's what you're motivated by, and any occasion where you're motivated by, some, by a desire which is not a desire for pleasure, the goal that you're aiming at is not pleasure. And the pleasure comes to pleasure of a consequence of satisfying the desire, just what I said before. And by the way, what I said before is written in Aristotle. It's not a new idea. And Abraham Maslow made it the foundation of his psychology in the middle of the 20th century. So there definitely are pleasures which are byproducts of what you do. And there are circumstances where the desire can't be a desire for pleasure. It can't be. And that shows you that at least sometimes what motivates you is not pleasure. Now, the comeback tell us to somebody, will be, well, Rabbi, I agree with you, with what you said, but you left out one aspect which undermines the goal of your argument. Yes, there can be desires for things other than pleasure. <clears throat> and yes, the actions which are undertaken aren't themselves actions for the sake of pleasure. But maybe all those things that you desire which aren't pleasure are means to get the pleasure eventually. And that's why the desires are what they are. They're getting you something which will get you pleasure eventually, like a desire for money. If I satisfy your desire for money by handing you a $100 bill, you're not finished. Because you're going to take the $100 bill and buy something. So yeah, sure. The $100 bill isn't pleasure, but it's the key to getting pleasure. So maybe all of the desires that you have are desires for pleasure eventually. Not immediately, but maybe eventually. Yeah, maybe. That's not a reason I should accept it, but I'm trying to show that it's not so. So I have to take care of the maybe also. Here, I think you can appeal to a person's psychology. Think yourself for yourself why you do things. And very often you do A to get B and B to get C and C to get D. Think of the chains that you have. Chains come to an end because your brain is finite. And if you believe your brain controls your mind, there's got to be an end to the, the chain somewhere. And th think of the thing that's the top and ask yourself whether that thing itself is a pleasure. So it's eventually <coughs> A to B and B to C and C to D all because they get to be the E and E is a pleasure every time. Whether the top of the chain is always pleasure every time. And here's an example, I have many examples, but I'll tell you, I don't, I don't have too much time now. I'll, I'll give you one which I think is uh, common to every person um, as part of your motivation and uh, I think is hard to deny. Somebody sees me handing out $500 to someone. I say, wow. How come you, uh, how come you gave him $500? I'll tell you why. Because I borrowed $500 from him and I promised to pay him back. So I'm paying him back. Uh-huh. So why did you pay him back? Why did I pay him back? Because I borrowed the money, you see. <laughs> I borrowed the money and when I borrow money, then I pay it back. Well, why do you do that? Why do you pay back money when you when you borrow it. 
Now, I might say, well, you know, I think about who I am. I think about who I'd like to be. I think about what it, what it means to have a, a good, valuable, noble existence. And paying your debts is part of that. I have a certain image of the kind of person I would like to be. Hopefully, I'm in part accomplishing that. And paying back debts is it's an expression of that person I would like to be. I'd like to be. Like to or what I'd like to be. And somebody says, but why do you want to be that person that you would like to be? At this point, I think I say, I don't think there's any other reason. I'm not doing that to make money. I'm not doing that to make a reputation. I'm not doing that to lower my blood pressure. I'd like to be that kind of person. That just draws me. It's something which it's noble. It's, it, to me, it's, it's, it's worth, it's, it's valuable. So I'm doing something that I think is valuable. I think that's the end of the story. I think that's quite normal and natural for people, sometimes, not always, just sometimes, to act on the basis of, this is the kind of person I would like to be. That's not pleasure. That's being a certain kind of person. It'll give pleasure, but that's the, the byproduct. When you get what you want, when you get what you desire, there's always a byproduct of pleasure, success of, of, of your project. But that's not what wasn't the issue. The issue is what do you do it for? So I think that the argument of, uh, uh, of the cynics is, is wrong. Number one, the argument of the cynic doesn't prove anything. It's just a simple, straightforward fallacy. And I told you, that's philosophical pablum. What I told you now, I don't know if everybody would agree with it. The only thing I can say from my own view, as I usually do, is that it's right. So... <laughs> Because I'm talking, so you can take that <laughs> with as much salt as you like. But at least it's something to be said. And then, therefore, someone who says, well, the Torah's idea of serving God the Shema out of love of the Master who commanded it is simply psychologically unrealistic because everything you always do is only for the sake of your own pleasure. I think that that is a view that can be resisted. That objection can be resisted. And therefore, we don't have to worry about it. I'll tell you why. Because I'm starting with the, with, the, with the assumption. I'm making an assumption, which I think will be sometimes psychologically true and sometimes not psychologically true. Well, I need it to be true sometimes. That the only pleasure available to him in this activity is achieving that goal. The only pleasure available to him is stimulating his interest in, play, in, in playing chess. Okay? Now, I ask, well then, what for him is stimulating his interest in playing chess? Is that itself a pleasure? Is it the pleasure of stimulating him to play chess? It can't be because the pleasure that's available is the pleasure of satisfying the desire. The desire can't be a desire for the pleasure. The pleasure comes after the desire is satisfied. It goes around in a circle. The, the picture that you have here is, I used to draw a, a, a thing on the board, Desire is a monster with a big mouth, with big teeth, you know. And the thing it's after is a ball with an X inside, right? And then the procedure is this. You feed the ball to the monster. The monster chomps on the ball, swallows it, and then, ah, I got what I wanted. Now the question is, what's the ball? If the ball itself is a pleasure, then there are two pleasures. There's the pleasure of the ball and the pleasure of the full stomach. That's two, not one. I'm assuming the only pleasure available is the pleasure of the full stomach. I think that's quite realistic. What else is in it to the guy if he, if he fails in, making, in, in, in interesting his, his cousin in, in chess? What, what could he possibly get out of it? He wasted time. He played a stupid game. He didn't, and, you know, he didn't, it didn't express his skill at all. You know, it was just a, a total loss. There's nothing in it other than getting him interested in chess. That isn't the pleasure because then there'll be two pleasures. I think that's, uh, that's the guts of the argument. But I don't know why it's hard to relate, it's hard to, relate to him. I, I said when I, when I state the conclusion, everybody says, where did that come from? I came right out of the words, really. <laughs> but that's what they say. Okay, think about it.